All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Red Light Report. Uh, today, we're going to be viewing and understanding light from a completely different paradigm. And it's from the paradigm of Erlen or Erlen syndrome. And so what I'm going to do briefly is give a quick, very superficial overview of what it is, then introduce our guest, and then we'll be off to the races. So this is straight from... Uh, the Erlen.com website. And so the quick review here is that Erlen is backed by over 40 years of research. Erlen is the pioneer and global leader in spectral filter color lens technology. This innovative breakthrough solution has helped millions of adults and children around the world. With hundreds of certified providers in 46 countries around the world, Erlen is the original creator of colored lens treatment for light-based visual processing difficulties. The Erlen method has earned millions of fans by providing a long-term, expertly developed solution for reading problems, headaches, migraines, light sensitivity, ADD and HD, autism, and many other light-based difficulties by directly addressing a core problem which is the brain's inability to process visual information and specific wavelengths of light. If you or your child have been suffering, then you deserve to know more about the wa most widely used, research-based, and effective solution available to you. And it goes on and on with other ways that the Erlen paradigm can help a myriad of diagnoses from migraines, brain injury, concussion, ADHD, autism, other learning difficulties. But well, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our our guest today, Terry Carlson, who is an Erlen uh, diagnostician. And without further ado, Terry, we've been talking for a little bit here before we press the record button, but, but welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to talk about this today. Thank you for having me, Mike. Appreciate it. So so before we jump into Erlen and, and to all that it is and how, how you utilize it, the paradigm that is, how did you come upon it? How did you learn about it? How did you get certified in it? What was your path? Uh, to where you are today. Okay, so my background is 20 plus years as a special education literacy specialist, and I'm an interventionist, which means I use a lot of programs that are geared towards supporting reading and writing skills that some students might have as deficits. In my course of teaching, I realized that I had a certain group of students that had a very high ability, but low performance, which means that they get it. So they could make a volcano, write about a volcano, talk about a volcano, join in a discussion group about a volcano, but they go to take a test on a volcano and they couldn't pass it. So what was this big gap? What's this big discrepancy that is there? So they, they just, and they also weren't able to access text on a page. So a literacy specialist brought in these overlays, is what they were called, and asked me if I'd heard of these. I said, no. And I said, what do I do with these? And they're colored plastic sheets. She said, just put them on the reading and see what happens. And I did. And sure enough, those kids went two or three grade levels above where they were actually were. So they were able to access the material on the page. Therefore, their reading levels matched their abilities and went up. Many of them were di were um, evaluated at a third grade level, and they were in seventh grade. I pretty much worked with seventh graders. And so, lo and behold, those kids started working out of my classes because it wasn't that they didn't know how to read, it's that they couldn't access the page. So I decided to go be trained as a screener, which is a person that identifies uh, the severity, if a person has Erlen syndrome, the severity, and if Erlen filters are appropriate for them, those are worn as glasses. We'll talk about that later. And I trained as a screener. In, in a couple of years, I, I screened the majority of the students in the schools and identified those that were the most severe and worked my way backwards. So the most severe got, got those the, the help first with the overlays, and then I did as many as I could because I was teaching full time. And then after about 10 years, I decided, well, I'm going to, it's time to retire from teaching and decided to become a full-time diagnostician. And di the difference between a diagnostician and a screener is that I screen and I diagnose and treat. The, the diagnostician is the one who, who fits people with the lenses and we mock them up. 
and write orders for those people and and support them in that in that way. So that's how I got started. And so, yeah, you and I got hooked up by a mutual person that we know, and I was just briefly reading through their, I guess, diagnostic report because they sent it to me. And there's just a couple of things I want to read through here just kind of to, to continue the conversation here and give people kind of a perspective, further perspective on, on, on what this Erlen syndrome is. And so just a couple of notes you had in there that stuck out to me was that Erlen syndrome is hereditary or it can be acquired from traumatic head injury, post-traumatic stress, or by other means. So that, that was interesting that A, it can be hereditary, but B you had a concussion or some type of TBI, that could put you in into the framework of, of needing some help via Erlen, correct? Yes, that's correct. In many cases, the people that I work with aren't aware of the symptoms that they have. So I help create that awareness by asking very specific questions they've never been asked before because many of the symptoms they have, they think are normal. Because if your your page is, is moving or shifting or doing things and you look at your neighbor's page, it's doing the same thing because you're looking through your eyes, but you're assuming they're seeing the same thing you are. And so once you become, those people become aware of this, then the more they're aware, the more they realize that their coping skills over time um, have taken a toll on their system and there's a way to relieve those, those symptoms and issues. The symptoms are very similar. If you have a head injury, PTSD, we work with people with fibromyalgia, cerebral palsy, autism. Those are all conditions or medical issues that affect the central nervous system. So what the color does is it calms the brain now with that down, which controls the whole body and the central nervous system, which calms everything down. So it can work in partnership with some other treatments as well or by itself. For hereditary purposes. Gotcha. That makes sense. How is Erlen syndrome diagnosed? Because like you're saying, there's all these different symptoms. Some of them, of course, you may think are normal. Some of them are uncomfortable, such as headaches, migraines, attention deficits. But how would you know to seek out someone like yourself who, who deals with people with Erlen syndrome, like with such a relatively unknown diagnosis, the how would people know that they have it without kind of tripping upon it, so to speak? So many people do trip upon it because they've exhausted all of their options, which is kind of a, a backwards way of putting it because if it was one of the first options, the first first option we have people get their eyes eyes checked. So clarity. And then stability is the Erlen piece. Are things clear and stable? Now we have an accurate baseline. If you don't have an accurate baseline, you can be misdiagnosed. So what happens is many people aren't aware of this, but what they're, I'll just give you kind of some scenarios that people have told me is that they go to their eye doctor first. So, you know, their eyes hurt, they have eye strain, they're getting headaches, they're feeling dizzy. So they go to the doctor or their eye doctor first. Those are the first two options. And they'll say, well, we don't see anything wrong here. Your vision is 20-20 or you've got glasses, but still having issues. So sometimes they'll prescribe stronger glasses, which then cause other issues. Or the doctor is like, well, there's nothing wrong, but you've got migraine, so let's put you on this medication. So now you're down, going down that road, right? Then if those two issues aren't resolved, then you might, you know, let's go get an MRI or a CAT scan. So then they go to the neuro neurological area and there's nothing wrong. So then, then what happens is people start, then they start doing their own research and they start making some connections somehow. Why is it every time I go into a store, I get a stomach ache and dizzy. And as soon as I walk out the door, I'm not anymore. They start making those, they start figuring out some connections of some sort, or they'll type in headaches. They'll type in migraines or they'll type in, they might type in light sensitivity. And I have people that tell me they're not light sensitive, but they have all of the other symptoms. So it's not necessarily, that's the trigger. So they are searching. They're searching for something for relief. And number one is validation. So a lot of people will go through this for many, many years, 20, 30 years, 
And once they find this, that's the biggest piece is somebody validating that they're not imagining these things in their environment, that they are real and they can be remediated through color. So let's, before we jump into the color aspect, I guess from an age spectrum perspective, so it's hereditary, that means you can be born with this. So what is the youngest person that you have treated? I'm curious. Four years old. Four, wow. And so how did yeah. they know to seek someone like you out in the Erlins, like you said, a diagnostician? Is that how you say it? Yeah, diagnostician, yeah. <laughs> uh, how did they know, how did the person with a four-year-old know to seek you out? Did they go down the allopathic road first, so to speak, and then they did the research and find you? So he was he was in working with an occupational therapist for, for some therapy because he had some sensory, people with sensory, you know, issues of some sort, sens either sensitivities to, to touch or to sound or to, you know, they're, they're hypersensitive to something within the environment. And so they were, he was being treated by an occupational therapist who was a screener. And so she's, she's like, eh, you know, let's, I'm not, you know, working with this, with this child and through conversation with the mom found out that he refuses to go anywhere outside of his house without his sunglasses on at four years old and they're wraparound goggles type sunglasses. And he just, you know, he couldn't, couldn't really explain it. And he was pretty articulate with what happens. Like, you know, as my eyes hurt, you know, he would say something he, he just refused to. And so she tested him with the overlays, which at, at his level was pretty much looking at some, find, find the letter B, find the letter A, because he wasn't, he wasn't quite reading yet. He was, he was close. But she found some overlays that worked for him and, and just his responses were, oh, my eyes feel better. Mm -hmm. And she could see him relax, you know. And the mom also has Erlen syndrome. So once we got him on with filters, we could just tell from his body language that he was much more comfortable and, and fit him with filters. And the mom had them as well. And she's had a very interesting story because once we had filters on her face, she looked down and she said, oh, there's my feet. She knew she had feet, but she, her body, her sense of her body in space was off because of the distortions in her environment. And she on purpose purchased a Tesla to park for her because her depth perception was so off that she couldn't park her car. So they sell park. So that helped him with that piece. So we just, you just kind of start putting pieces of the puzzle together and then doing some research and you find Erlen. Interesting. So yeah, just quickly jumping back to that diagnostic report from that individual. I'm just going to read a couple more things to complete the picture here. And then we'll carry on. Another bit was academic and work performance, behavior, attention, ability to sit still, and concentration are among the issues that can be affected. Individuals with undiagnosed problems of Erlen's may have been considered to be underachievers who may have been told they could do better if they tried har harder. Some individuals have been misdiagnosed with motivational, behavioral, or attitudinal problems or as having attention deficits, dyslexia, or reading disabilities. So I wanted to read that just to give people who are listening to this that may be dealing with a constellation of these symptoms to, you know, open their eyes to the possibility that maybe they are dealing with Erlen syndrome. Cause like you've alluded to with some of your stories, uh, a lot of people are just not being treated with the quote unquote normal treatments. And when they do the research, the path leads them to Erlen syndrome. And on that topic on Erlen.com, there are some self tests that people can take. And I don't know how, um, viable those are, or if they're an accurate diagnostic, maybe you could tell us a little more about those, Terry. Yeah, those self-tests are are accurate. There's the same tests, it's just a different format than what I send out to people. But some of the questions would be becoming anxious under brighter fluorescent light. So we're starting to put, we need to put these connections together, right? So why are people 
anxious? Where's the anxiety coming from? They need to just they need to kind of track when they're feeling more anxious and when they're not. So if they're able to control their lighting in their house and the lights are always off, dim lighting, right? They turn their screen down all the way or they change the color on the their screen or reverse it. So they need to start making those connections. You know, they close all the blinds and then when they go outside, they have to wear sunglasses. So there's a difference in sunglasses. I'm kind of going off a little bit, but there's so much information. Do you wear sunglasses because you want to look cool? Aviators are in or, you know, Oakleys are in right now. They match my outfit. Or do you wear them because if you don't, you get a headache, your eyes water, there's eye strain, you feel dizzy. There's a whole different, there's a different ball game, fashion versus, you know, physical symptoms that are painful. And if you take those off, it's like, whoa, I, I, I have to put, I have to put them back on to be outside. Many people wear sunglasses when they go shopping or they have, they have them on their face all day long in all situations. So they, people need to, need to kind of think about that. Some of the other questions are on the self tests, and these are the ones online. There's a, those are free self tests online on the website, the erla.com website. Um, attention and concentration, like you mentioned with behavioral issues, we need to, we need to dig deeper and see, is this a person that is angry or frustrated? Many of the people that I see are frustrated because they want to complete a task. They want to do their schoolwork. They need to be on the computer for eight hours a day, but after, as soon as they turn it on, they're instantly, you know, whatever symptoms appear immediately, but they push through and they're frustrated because they can't, there's nothing that they can do to make it go away besides take, you know, a hundred breaks during the day. Easily distracted when, you know, when reading or listening, or even when you're in a crowded room, are you having trouble focusing on the person you're talking to? The background noise, that's a sensory piece. We look at writing, math, music. Music is a tough one because the page, there's lines and then all the notes on the lines. If all of that is moving, it's very distracting. So many people that I work with are auditory learners. They don't use their visual sense, which is 70% of what we do. That's 70% of how we learn. The rest of the senses take over the 30%. But most of the people I work with are auditory learners. So they play music by ear. And they have they use they listen to auditory books instead of reading books. Depth perception is a is a big issue, and many of the people I work with see everything in two dimensions instead of three, but don't realize it until we start working with the filters. An interesting question that people always point to is when walking to someone, do you drift into that person? And when you're walking down the street, are you drifting into them? Because your depth perception is off. When walking, do you feel dizzy or lightheaded? So people are just walking around and they feel dizzy. That's that's not normal. They think it's normal. So they just kind of learn to deal with it. And eventually it takes a toll on their system. We ask questions about sports, like catching a ball. How long did it take you to ride a bike? That's all, you know, equilibrium, depth perception. If you're If the concrete is going like this and the trees are going like this, you're not sure where you're riding your bike. Driving is a big issue, and then fatigue while in a car because of the glare from the headlights and the night, night driving. All of those areas are covered on those free self tests that are on the Erlin website. But that's the first step for people to realize that what they're experiencing is not normal, but it's their brain and the light playing tricks on their brain. And is there a way to remediate it and make it stop so that I can function normally? So people that I work with answer yes to almost every question. So you have to kind of have a little paradigm shift again. They answer yes to almost every question on those forms. And if you're a person that answered no, it's like, well, I'm not sure I get it. Well, think of the people that answer yes to all of those. And they're not just happening one at a time once in a while. This is all of the time at the same time. So there's a lot going on that their brain is not processing correctly. And I have a brain scan that I could that I could share too that might help explain it as well. As far as um, something we could share with the audience after? Yeah. Sure. Yes. You know, great. And I was just going to say, 
like you were explaining, uh, the paradigm shift for someone like me who answered no to all of the questions, and then I know someone who's answered yes to all of the questions, it's the paradigm shift, like you said. And it gives you compassion and empathy for the person that's dealing with that. Because like you said, it's not just one or two of these issues. And this takes me to the video on the homepage that we should let the audience who's listening on the audible version to go to the homepage. And and what is it called, Terry? Sample sample distortions. Sample distortions. A little bit, yeah. the video, but it goes through what words look like on a page. Some of them are swirling. Some of them are wavy. Some of them are like the Star Trek where it's moving away from you. Um, some of them are... I don't even know how to explain it. It's 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 crazy to see what these distortions look like if you're quote unquote normal, knowing that people are dealing with this. And like Terry mentioned, they might not just be dealing with just the wavy form or just the swirly form. It's a combination of all of these different distortions and movements. And imagine what that does to a person's brain and their perception of reality or how they're just moving about physically in the world. Uh, so like I was saying, it gives you more compassion and empathy knowing people are dealing with this. And like you said, they show up frustrated or angry, but especially frustrated because they're trying to navigate this world, yet they can't because of what their brain is processing, which kind of takes me to another question. And this is a term that comes up a lot with the Erlen syndrome, um, is perceptual processing disorder. What is that specifically? We probably already talked about it, but if you could go a little more in depth about that. Right, and the brain scan that we'll, we'll show later was a really good visual of it. As soon as a person opens their eyes, in fact, people that if you keep your eyes closed, a lot of you can you can sense what's in the light when it's light and dark, even with your through your eyelids. And many of the people I test, I test with their eyes closed, and they open their eyes eventually. <laughs> but um, all of us, as soon as we open our eyes, our brain is flooded with light, and light travels at different speeds. Some of it is fast, and some of it is slow. There's receptors in the brain that read those wavelengths of light accurately, or if you have an Erlen brain, it's it's inaccurate. So those receptors are misformed or they're damaged somehow. So those wavelengths of light are coming in at the wrong speed, causing those distortions and physical symptoms. And what we do with the color is we normalize the wavelengths of light that are bothering that person. And as soon as, as long as they have these filters on their face or they're looking at the overlays, those wavelengths are, or the brain is processing those wavelengths of light accurately, eliminating all of those physical distortions and symptoms. Interesting. So let's just go into quote unquote treatment with you. Let's say I walk in, this is an initial evaluation, you're diagnosing me. How do you determine, okay. in a sense, you know, which color of the lens or overlay is going to best suit my? needs based on my perceptual processing disorder or however you want to quote that. Okay. So the first step is to complete those forms because that gives us a baseline. And many people tend to under-report on those forms because they've never been asked these questions before. And and there is a question mark there that they can circle if they're not sure that's fine because this is a starting point. So the screening is the first step of the process. And that's the big educational piece because I know it's been an hour and a half talking about what this is, how it's affecting them in particular, based on what they've told me here and through our conversation. So they come in and we do a, it's called a short intake and I do an environmental test and I have them focus on one object and we work our way out. And many of the people I work with can only perform this task without the lights on. Their level, at, I work on a scale of zero to 10, and they're at like a level six or a seven, which means that I'm starting to get a headache or I'm feeling dizzy, just focusing. And it only takes about 10 or 15 seconds focusing on one object in there. They're already at a six or a seven. And so I, I do that for environmental pieces. We do a short little family intake. Is this hereditary? Is it not? Are there other people that might be affected? I want you to kind of think about this. So this is an awareness creating the awareness piece for people. And then we go into um, looking at specific pictures and they're on shiny white pages and they're black on white. And I have people um, perform different tasks like counting the white spaces in this box. 
And then I asked them specific questions like, you know, was it easy or hard? What made it hard? You know, did lines jiggle, move? Are they wavy? Are they, there's a lot of questions that I asked throughout this process. And there's several pictures, four or five pictures that I show them. We work our way through those. Many of the people I work with get to the first or second picture and then they're up to the level six or a seven. And then we stop and we go to the color overlays after that. Color overlays are coated with the actual filter process. And they look like this. So they're like a nine by 13 plastic sheet coated with the filter process. And I put those down on the page. Um, and there's a certain process that I use for that. And it's trial and error. Kind of like going to the eye doctor, A or B, B or C, which one's better, which one's worse, which one's. So we go through the process and determine which overlay or combination of overlays make all of those distortions go away. So throughout this process, they have told me and given me a lot of information. And then I work my way backwards and we want them to stop, whatever that is. It will also stop the physical symptoms. So if a person is physically dizzy, they're nervous, like their knee is shaking um, or they're weaving back and forth or whatever, whatever is happening with them, those will stop as well. They're all connected to the brain. The brain is, is operating in a system and it's, it's out, of, out of whack. So we want to bring it back where it's accurate. So a combination or one overlay or a combination of overlays that works best to make all those symptoms stop. And then we, we take the page off and it's like everything comes back. As soon as you put it back down, everything stops. That's how we know. So we know immediately at the testing, yes or no. The issue is this only works for reading. So you can put this on your laptop or on your book or your paper. But as soon as you look up, you're back to ground zero. And I like to use the analogy of a magnifying glass where I can read with a magnifying glass, but I can't drive with that. I can't hold it up and see a stop sign. It's only meant for, you know, for reading on a page, right? So the next thing we do is we identify the moderate to severe people are the ones that benefit the most from the filters, which are worn as glasses or contacts. And they're colored lenses, and I have a lens kit of about 100 color lenses, and I can make 100,000 combinations with the kit because you can do them individually or layer them up. And in some cases, I have people with different colors on each eye, depending oh. on the person. Yeah. And they're, they're lenses, and we, it's trial and error, so we start with the lights low and, you know, what's bugging you in the room. So it could be that... That red dot on that monitor over there, I can't look at it. As soon as I look at it, my I feel it, you know, in my forehead. I feel it, you know, in my nose. There's all it brings up all these senses. So we work with that and work our way up to full lighting. And they they might need one lens. They might need. I had one lady with 22, but she had to come back three times because I can only layer them about eight eight high. Um, otherwise, it gets started getting distorted, and so. I have one lady right now in contacts that has 11 different colors. So we just work our way through the process. And it takes one to two hours to go through that process. And then I mock up the lenses. I write up the order. A person brings me their, their frames or their prescription glasses. And we tint them at the lab in California, Long Beach, California. And they make them and they mail them off to the person. Then they're all ready to go and they get them in the mail. We put them on their face and there they are. It's all done. With people yep. with Erlen syndrome, are they predominantly those that wear glasses or contacts or not necessarily? Like if, if I'm a person, no. personally, I don't wear glasses, I would then be wearing either contacts or glasses to allow me to have it on my face at all times, essentially, or my, my brain to process through that color. Yes. Yeah. And I do have people that ask me, do I have to wear these all the time? But you don't have to wear them if, if you know, don't want to feel good. Don't wear them. <laughs> Right, right. You know, you just like, like, you know, if I want the world to be blurry for a while, I'll take my glasses off. So, yeah, it's 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 totally up to you. But, you know, people that are very, very severe, they will lay down at night, you know, and, and go to bed with their eyes, you know, close their eyes, take their glasses off, put them next to the nightstand. And then when they wake up in the morning, they don't even open their eyes. They put their filters on first and then they get up mm -hmm. because they they 
you know, they realize how much they've been coping for many, many years and don't want to go back to that. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. kind of, uh, I guess, rhetorical question, but I guess once you find the lens and overlay that fits you to, to reduce your uh, sensitivity, so to speak, that's kind of a lifelong antidote to the situation. Right. The, the overlays are a reflective process. So the light is bouncing off of the page into your eyes. The lenses are a refractive process where you're looking through a lens. So the colors are going to be different. And it says right on here, don't tint lenses this color. Because if they're the right color or combination of colors, a person, the person wearing them does not see color. The world is clear. Mm. So you've got to, and I have to work really hard to teach them to separate comfort from darkness. So things are bright, but do they still hurt? Okay. They can be bright and not hurt. And many people are conditioned to expect it to hurt because it always has. So we have to kind of, it takes a while sometimes to separate those two. So the lenses are, um, you know, things will not be dim. And in, in many cases, colors are more vibrant because they've been dull for people for so long. Or they've they've worn sunglasses for so long because things are you know now dimmer and dull. The colors aren't true, um, but with the lenses they are. But when you look at a person, so here's a sample of a lens, and if you look at a person with these lenses on, you'll see turquoise, a form of turquoise, and there might be some other colors in here too. But if I if these were my colors, the world would be nice and crisp and clear, and not dim. With me, the world looks dim and it looks blue. And you will see color on my face, but the person wearing them will not see color. So what is that in the eye or the brain that's making that happen? I mean, I know that's kind of like a massive rabbit hole or... It is. It is. <laughs> I mean, it's just... Well, it's, wavelengths. it's the wavelengths of light for this person, this color normalizes them. And that's that trial and error going so, through the process to determine which ones. So what's happening to the light when it's hitting the lens? The person is not perceiving a different color, but it's filtering a different color into their eyes, into their brain, which actually to them is normal, right? So what is it in their right. brain or in right. their eye or along that path that is causing it to be their, their world distorted, I guess, necessitating this color to, to then normalize it? Like what's going on yeah. internally? Yeah. Yeah, it's the parvo and the magno cells. Yeah, the magna, it's 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 those receptors in the brain that are not formed correctly. And so or they're damaged. Hereditary, but like you're saying, it can be TBI or brain damage, correct? And I guess or some illness, some illness as well. Illnesses can cause it. And so is we have the long co long COVID people. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So this has been around for upwards of 40 plus years, right? And so a lot of health maladies have come about, precipitated, and or gotten exponentially worse the past, we can say, 40 to 60 years. Is Erlen syndrome something that was around, let's say, a century ago? Or is some of this due to man-made technology? Now we're surrounded by screens. Now we have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and 5G everywhere. Is part of that playing a role into the issues? Because, I mean, again, all of that's going to ramp up your sympathetic nervous system. And like you're saying, when people can find the right color or the lens or, or what have you, it calms them down and it kind of gets them in more of a parasympathetic state, it seems. So as part of this man-made, outside of the hereditary component, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Personally, I think it was probably around, but the awareness has come around. Now we know like, like autism, may have been around, may not, may have been created by other things, we're not sure, but the, the sensory, st overstimulation of sen sensory issues has been around for a long time. We may have just labeled it differently. I'm not really sure. It, it, well, we even go back to glasses. When glasses were first discovered that it could make the, they could make the world clear, right? So you can think back, was vision for some people always bad? Probably. Right. But there wasn't anything they could do about it. So then we came across, you know, glasses. 
and created those to help make vision better. I'm not I'm not really sure if it's an evolution kind of thing or if it's been around for a long time. And I'm not really sure. Well, going into the history of Erlen, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how this was even discovered? Like, how did a person decide to throw different, you know, types of colors on on those transparencies? I forget what they're called on on to paper. Yeah, the overlays. Overlays yeah. for, for real. Yeah. And then for lenses, like, how did that come about? All right. So Helen was given a federal grant. Helen Erlen, who's the founder, was given a federal grant back in 1983, 82, 83, to work with college students to to try to figure out why their reading levels were, why they were struggling, struggling readers, struggling learners. And somebody happened to come in from a drama class with the gels that cover the lights in the drama class. And they're just like flimsy plastic, you know, pieces of paper that you would just cover the into you know to dim the light or make it make the the lighting yellow or blue or green or whatever and they just happened to put them down on their book and they started talking and started messing with them and saying oh the words aren't moving anymore or oh i can see the words clearly now with the blue one or the green one or what and helen picked up on this conversation and then it went from there wow so it's just and she says that if she had had this she doesn't. She doesn't have Erlen syndrome. But if she had had it, she might not have discovered it because she would think that what they were saying was normal. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So, so she picked up on this conversation and it evolved from there. And even though it's only been around for 40 years, because that's a relatively short amount of time in the scheme of things, mm -hmm. there's a lot of solid research on this. And again, if you go to Erlen's.com, there's a whole tab or a whole page about the research. And again, just want to read briefly because I thought it was interesting. Migraine, a very typical one, something I dealt with when I was a physical therapist. But a piece of research says that the research showed a normalization of cortical activation and spatial frequency tuning in the migrainers by precision tinted filters, which suggests a neurological basis for the therapeutic effect of these lenses in reducing visual cortical hyperactivation in the migraine. So a lot of... Mm -hmm. Fancy words kind of say what you explained with the treatment process, but also citing, you know, the research has shown there's an there's a change in in the cortices and what's going on neurologically to see these positive results. So, I mean, that's only one of many, many pieces of research out there uh, to give validation to this, to the Erlen syndrome uh, technique. Right. And if you think about when the body is under stress, the chemical release of cortisol all and other, you know, other fight or flight type of... <laughs> type of the scenarios that we, the release of all of those that just relate to everything else that spirals out kind of out of control. And you have to, everybody has their point where they need to stop doing what they're doing and take a break. So it could be, uh, you know, a miter headache. I get to work, I open up my screen and after about five minutes, my headache's worse. So I got to go take, take an aspirin and come back. Right. So that where what is the what is the reaching point for a person to stop and take that break? And the severe people are you know twenty minutes or less to stay on an activity without symptoms. You know if those symptoms creep up within twenty minutes, and many of the people I work with, it's immediate. They just push through. So I help them realize when do you first notice your headache? When do you first notice your eye strain? When you first notice that your stomach hurts, when you first, and they're not really sure because they keep working with under those conditions and they might reach for another cup of coffee or they take two more Tylenol 10 minutes later, or they, you know, they're doing things to cope and get through their job for the day or getting through their assignments or whatever it is they need to do to make it happen. Right. For some people, this can be a spontaneous realization or epiphany or like paradigm shift in their perspective or the reality, right? Like if you find the right color, it's just, it can be automatic with some of these results. It is automatic. It either is or it isn't. It either works or it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. So that's how you know you're on the right color. It's either a profound shift or you need to keep searching for the right color. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Exactly. And there, I think there have been four people in 12 years that I've tested that were not, did not have Erlen syndrome. 
So I've tested thousands of people and 99.99% of them, this is it, a piece of it, a piece of sweat bothering them. But those four people were either, either were, were kind of eliminating this as an issue because they kind of knew that it wasn't, but they wanted to make sure. Or they were students in a school that didn't really want to do school and were messing around. So, you know, <laughs> they were kind of like ruling this out. They kind of knew this wasn't it, but they wanted to rule it out 100%. Gotcha. But by the time people get to me, they pretty much have realized they've come across something that can help and they're, they're on the right track. Yeah. And that's one of the questions I was going to ask, actually, is are there any synergistic treatments with this that you have found? You said this is kind of can be a piece to the puzzle. Have you found or do you know of any other treatments that work in tandem very well with these Erlen lenses? That's very individual. So I'll give you a couple of a couple of scenarios. I have one gentleman, his name is Bert, was a roller was in a rollover car accident, broken bones. His bones healed, but over that period of healing time, his light sensitivity and noise sensitivity issues crept in. It took about a year for them to take full effect for him. So he um, slowly over time was covering his windows with black plastic. He has, he has a couple of videos out there that um, will be on my website when I get that up and running in about a month. But he, um, he took sunglasses and he took black electrical tape and taped the tape over his sunglasses and left a little slit of about a millimeter wide so he could watch his feet when he walked. He took black foam behind his glasses and he taped them to his face because it was so severe. So he, has, he had two kids, you know, and a wife and, you know, was a family guy. Eventually he moved into his garage, which was pitch black with no windows at all. His wife happened to find me and I came over and tested him and he started with eight different colors that were super dark. You couldn't see his eyes. But it was a starting point. So Bert, over time, and this is rare, I've had two people, healed to the point where now he's in one filter. Mm. So that's another piece of this, too. As people heal from brain injuries or illnesses, their colors can change or they can they can work their way out of the colors. But I haven't seen anybody 100% work their way out because they're healing. And, and their colors can change over time, too, because our bodies change. As far as working, he tried 14 different treatments. Some things made work, made it worse. Light therapy made it worse because, of course, it was light sensitive now, so that just made things worse. Um, some type of occupational therapist, a lot of things his insurance didn't cover, so he didn't pursue them. Supplements didn't seem to work a whole lot for him. The two pieces that did work were the Erlen filters and stem cell. Those were the two out of the 14 that made the biggest difference for him. I have another person who has had a lot of head and neck injuries that I recently started with a young man. He's in his early 20s. And he is working in conjunction with a chiropractor and with his filters. And I know that his, I asked his chiropractor to test him with and without his filters. And with his filters, his Feet are in perfect alignment, and without his filters, one foot moves a half an inch off. Put them back on, it goes right back to normal. So it's very individual, and people don't give up. I mean, there, it's going to take a lot of a lot of work to figure out if this is a piece of it. At least you've got your central nervous system calmed down, and maybe some of the treatments that you've tried will work better because the central nervous system isn't fighting them off and being overstimulated. But there may be some other ones out there that will work, so keep trying. But as long as you've got your central nervous system calmed down, I'm finding with people I work with that those other treatments work better because it's calmed down. Sure. It's not fighting against them. Yep. Yeah. Um, specific to light sensitivity is, let's say, fluorescent lights. If someone's extremely sensitive to those, and that's like their main symptom. Is that something Erlen's going to help with? Or is Erlen's more like, again, you're looking at a constellation of symptoms more so than an individual one? It seems as though fluorescent and LEDs. Now, now, some people like fluorescence, so they, they don't do well with LEDs and vice versa. Mm -hmm. 
depending on the total, it's totally individual. The fluorescent and the LEDs tend to bring the symptoms on, on quicker because the brain is processing those types of lights, like natural lighting, correctly. Natural lighting affects people the same way. It just takes longer for the symptoms to build over the day. So it might, you know, it might take six or eight hours. If a person is a landscaper, they're still at the, by the end of the day, are going to have a headache or a migraine or the fatigue issue, but it takes six or eight hours for it to build. Now, if a person is in an office with fluorescent lights on, it could take five minutes. Because the brain is just not, it's not processing these unnatural types of lights correctly. Now, I do have people, it's really interesting, that they'll have a little lamp on in the back of the room just for some light and everything is dark, but they have three gigantic monitors that they're looking at, right? And they haven't made the correlation that they're staring into a fluorescent light bulb. Even if they reverse the screen with a black background and white print or like with our screen, we've got the, you know, our images on the screen with a black background, yeah. but there's still a lot of fluorescent lighting coming through. And I have a lot of people I'm working with too, that didn't realize that the EMFs are affecting them. Even with their eyes closed, they can feel the screen in their body and they can sense the fluorescent lights, the flickers of the lighting, and they can, they can sense those as well, even with their eyes closed. So a lot of this is creating that awareness of you got to make the connection of what is, what environments am I really struggling with? You're probably struggling in all of them. Some of them are just taking longer for that to build. Yeah. And that brings up a good point as far as like this invisible light, whether it's infrared from the sun or uh, these other wavelengths from non-native EMF sources. I'm guessing mm -hmm. early can help with that. I mean, if, the human eye can't perceive it. Are we still picking up the signal in our brain? Does that make sense? Like, like if we can't see it, yeah, we still perceive it, and thus can Erlen still help with that? I mean, how how would you tease that? Yeah, out? trial and error. That's through the screening process. Interesting. Yeah, and it either, like I said, it either and people that people that this doesn't work for when I take the overlays off. Like, let's say they pick an aqua overlay. And they decide that that's the best one. And then I take it off and go, oh, no, I kind of like the white better, the high contrast. So we need light to see. We just need to process it correctly so it doesn't cause all those physical symptoms and distortions. You, we need to be able to, we need it. Sure. And as yeah. far as the colors, jumping back to that again, have you found over the years any patterns with certain colors and how people present to you? Like if, if someone's getting like an orange or an amber lens versus a green versus a yellow, do you see any patterns or is it more so you're just trying to fit, again, find what works for them and move on? Yep. Yep. It, exactly. It's very individual. And so there's no... There's no consistency. There's no, like, like yellow, you know, like if you, have, if you have depression and it, you know, if you're suffering from depression, yellow is not necessarily going to brighten your day you know it just it doesn't work that way you have to you have to try them gotcha. it's, a, it's an experience let's put it that way it's an experience yeah it's an n equals one experiment in a way yeah so um on a recent podcast that helen did during early awareness week in october she mentioned that 72 percent of the colors that they create at the lab are unique hmm. that's pretty high yeah. Unique meaning? I mean, there's only one of them. Wow. Yeah. What's Highly that? customized for each person's brain. And all of our brains are different. And the questions you're asking are really common because people are like, well, if I have blue eyes, I'm supposed to be more light sensitive. Well, that's not, that's, that's not true with everybody. <laughs> so we can't put everything in a box. So you've got to, you've got to really kind of dig deep and realize that this could be a solution for those symptoms that you've had for many, many years and nobody's been able to discover. It's just like, I guess you're just going to have to live like this. Yep. How many clinicians are there like yourself worldwide nowadays? Well, we're in 46 countries. My kit, when I got my kit, I was like 435. So they're, they're active diagnosticians, I don't really have the number. It's between 500 and 1,000 somewhere all over the world. 
So there's not very many of us. There's a lot more screeners. Right. Yeah. Well, you have to be in person to go through the filters and to make sure you get the right color. You can yes. do you can do the screen yes. like through Zoom, but you have to be in person for the actual choosing of the colors. Yeah, because you get you need to experience them face to face. And the lenses, the lenses you you need to try those because I the kits travel with us, obviously. And you've got to put you gotta put each one up at a time. Kind of like going to the eye doctor, you can't, you know, you can't try <laughs> those lenses on through the screen. You've got to you gotta be doing it in person. Yeah. On average, yeah. how many treatments does it take to nail it down to where they, they have the color or colors of of choice? One? We do it the first time. Yep, they know. Now some people need more than one pair, mm. um, indoor and outdoor. Sometimes that, but I would say my clientele, about 5%, need an indoor and an outdoor pair. But 95% of them, that works indoor and outdoor. So we start with the low light and work our way up all the way with all the lights on inside. And then we go outside and work with outdoor filters. So this is a pretty wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, profound experience. <laughs> if it's the person, right? I mean, that's that's a huge deal to not only find the solution, but like it's there for the rest of your life. I mean, that's, that's a life changer. You're exactly right. And I've had people tell me that they didn't, didn't think they would be here today if they hadn't found this because they couldn't get anybody to, to validate their symptoms, let alone help them with their symptoms. Or they would diagnose them with something and, and put them on medication that either made things worse or didn't make any difference for them. And that's what I ask people. So you know, they're diagnosed with something and they're put on something. I said, well, is that, is that working? It's like, well, it's making me feel worse or it hasn't made any difference. It's like, this is non-invasive. So it's like, what do you have to, you know, have everything to gain and nothing to lose by being screened yep. or if nothing else, go onto the website, take the self test. They'll send it back to you and say, yes, please, you know, you need to be screened based on the results of your of your results here. Um, you can also, if you go to the home page, there are 10 different colored lenses at the top of the screen. And when you click on each one of those, the background will turn a different color. Oh. And I've had people get a get a, in touch with me. They'll hit the blue and they'll be like, my headache went away instantly. So you really have to be in tune with your body. Wow, I'm doing it right now. And how it's feeling and how it's reacting and responding. Or when I hit the yellow and I had I was squinting and I hit the green and my eyes relaxed or my shoulders dropped or, you know, so you can play around with those background colors. Yeah. Now, mind you, that's a simulated computer color, but right. Right. it gives people an idea that they might be onto something if they're feeling different. Now, personally, the more white, the better, the more light, the better. And I like the high contrast black on white. All of the rest of them just don't don't do anything for me. Right. With kids nowadays, there's like a seemingly exponential increase in like ADHD, ADD, or just kids not learning well, or however you want to label it. Is this something, if you have a kid or kids that are dealing with school issues or attention issues, they're like, this is something they should check out. They should have their kid take the self-test and then kind of take things from there based on the results? Absolutely. Yes. And if you just suspect, I mean, if they're just a little bit below grade level or they're struggling with one or two things, take the self-test. It's free. You'll have, you know, if it's like, well, maybe they just need more practice. It's not this. At least rule it out. Right. But this is a great intervention for kids in third grade because the text changes in fourth grade. The print is smaller and the picture support goes away. We need kids to be reading at grade level at third grade, you know, and if we need this extra support, it's an accommodation. And if they need this, it's considered a 504 plan. If people aren't sure what that is, it's a plan that allows a person in school to use certain accommodations. Now, that 504 plan can cover medication. It can cover crutches. It can cover a wheelchair. It's an extra support that is needed for a person to perform at their best, whatever that is. An IEP 
is for those with learning specific learning disabilities that need modifications. Modifications could mean shortened assignments because this person is not able to produce at the level, you know, like a, uh, they could produce one sentence versus a five paragraph essay. Basically, that's just their their skill level. That's their ability level. And it matches that. This is an accommodation where it could mean that they need a different testing area or they need low lighting. They could wear a hat with a, bri a dark brim to block out the light. There's different things that they can accommodate with. And those are written into a plan and, pe and parents need to get with their counselor and write that plan together. But that's what this is. The treatment for this is the overlays. Colored paper is another piece. And the Erlen filters, a hat, anything that blocks out the light or processes the light differently so the person can access the information. Interesting. You said you've been doing this for about uh, uh, 12 years or so? Yeah, 12, 13 years. Yeah. I as mean, a diagnostician. As a diagnostician. Yeah. Has, has this whole experience of treating people like this changed your perspective on light and its role on health in general? Changing people's perception? of light and what that does to their health? I mean, does that expand to other areas of life in your mind? Um, it can, but we can't get away from light. We have to we have to navigate our life in light. And we need light to process the information that we use in our environment. In 2014, I believe it was when they decided the incandescent bulbs were no longer energy-wise, right? So they switched everything out to fluorescence which have lower energy, but greater impact on a certain group of people. So 46% of the population are on the slight to severe continuum of Erlen, where they have light sensitivity of some sort, from slight to severe, 46%. 54% do not. So the 54%, of course, are, are the majority. So now we've got fluorescent lighting, LEDs, all, you know, we're just in this world yeah. and that's what we have to navigate in at the expense of other things. But we have to take care of ourselves and figure out what works for us so that we can navigate in our world. Yes, you can use your magnifying glass to do all of your reading with, but it's much easier to get a pair of reading glasses to put on your face. So, you know, we're all responsible to take care of ourselves and figuring out what's going to work best for us. And what I'm finding is a lot of people are are suffering out there and they either know it and haven't found a solution yet or they're not aware of it and think that it's normal. So we got to create that awareness and educate people about this as well. 100%. You've educated me today, Terry. I appreciate you coming on. Uh <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any other thoughts or anecdotes or, um, you know, points of interest you want to say before we hop off this, this uh, interview? I'm just saying, and this has been life-changing for me as well. And every person that I meet, of course, is unique and their situations are unique. And I'm, I'm learning so much from the people I work with. There was uh, my last trip. Um, I do travel quite a bit. I'm traveling a lot into Montana, Alaska. Idaho and Oregon, and of course, all over Washington state. But on my last trip, I met a lady who had a stroke in her early 20s, and she's in her 70s now. And as a result, she was pretty much blind. I mean, she can kind of navigate through her world, but it's almost like being in a underwater in a swimming pool. Everything is really murky. And it was amazing because we got a couple of the filters on her face and she was able to actually see the door in the room we were in. She couldn't tell where it was before. And it was a dark brown door against off white walls. So the contrast was there. She just wasn't able to see it. But with the filters, she could tell where the door was. She could see the Kleenex box on the counter. She could see the cords coming from the hair dryer. I mean, it was amazing, amazing to me that she had been without her sight for over 50 years. And these were able to help her. So I'm finding all sorts of people that are, they're still searching. So this is, this is the easiest test besides your vision test to do, to get that baseline. And then you can work from there if there's still other issues. Great. I mean, then they're going to work. You're going to find the right 
the right intervention that's going to help you. If this is all it is, then put the filters on your face and go live a happy, high quality life <laughs> without all of those symptoms. Yeah. So that's that's the great part. Oh, I appreciate you coming on and sharing the information and sharing the story. You. Even if it helps just one person listening to this podcast, that would make it all worth it. But just the fact that you're bringing the awareness to everyone. So now we can go about our lives. And if we have any family or friends that are dealing with issues, well, now we know of Erlen syndrome and we can refer them and potentially impact their life for, for positive. So whether a person has Erlen or not, at least we're aware of it now. So I appreciate you educating us all. Where should people go to learn more about you or from you or from Erlen specifically? So if they go to the Erlen website, the main one, Erlen.com, there are two of them. There's the erlensyndrome.org website that has a lot more educational types of tools in there. That's our foundation. But go to the Erlen website. You can find a testing center there um, in all the countries and, and where everybody is on the globe for testing purposes and navigate through those self-tests as well. But that would be step number one is to take one of those self-tests and then look at the colors and then find someone in your area and contact you know, get connected with them and they'll, they'll help you through the process. Perfect. Well, yeah. very appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing. And everyone, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy this information. Again, if, if you are dealing with any of these symptoms, go check it out, erlin.com. Or if you know of someone, again, family or friend, please refer them to that site or um, what was that .org, Erlin's Foundation? Erlinsyndrome.org and it's I-R-L-E-N. Perfect. Yeah, we'll leave those links in the show notes so you guys can just scroll down to the podcast description and you can click those links and it'll take you directly to those websites. But for, for Terry Carlson, this is Dr. Mike Belkowski signing off of another episode of the Red Light Report. And you guys have a fantastic week.